I didn't think much of the potential setup with a friend's ex until the day of her wedding. Then I got a case of the jitters. Hooking up with someone at a wedding wasn't anything all that outlandish to me and my redheaded slut party persona. But this wasn't just a random fling. It was a premeditated arrangement amongst an inner network of lesbians that had gone global. My new inclusive, exclusive friend group was counting on me to defy stereotypes of the menacing bisexual wolf in rainbow sheep's clothing. <laughs> or maybe she was just trying to help her friend out and get her friend laid. Either way, I was hopeful not to disappoint. Fellow was the friend who started it all. We met in 2016 through a support group for those recovering from the loss of a loved one. Her brother died the year before in a grisly motorcycle accident. And my mom died in my arms after losing her battle with alcoholism a few years before that. We were steeped in tragedy. But my misery had a soft spot for her company. Fellow put her faith in me and expanded my safety net to include her friends, Nicole and Sarah. We first met at a show for turning writers into rock stars through the art of live storytelling. <laughs> they radiated a rare kind of nurturing energy reminiscent of the doting parents I wish I had, and they informally adopted me. Together with Fellow's wife, the five of us made the queer chosen family friend group I dreamed of being part of ever since I dared to dream of belonging. So when I got the invite to celebrate the union of Nicole and Sarah in 2018, of course I said yes. And when they asked me if I was attracted to one of Nicole's exes who was flying in from overseas to be in the wedding party, I had questions. Meche was without a plus one and she was looking to have a good time while on holiday. Uh, Nicole and Meche had played on the same team in college well over a decade ago. After dating for a bit, they realized they were better teammates than lovers. Thus, Nicole gave me her blessing to pursue an ex turned close personal friend. My perpetually amorous heart was elated, but I swiftly tucked away any and all expectations that something would actually happen. Most lesbians don't do this for just anyone. Certainly not a devout bisexual. Not only are we the silent letter of the alphabet mafia, we are actively mistrusted. Without trust, there can be no love. Without love, I go back to being a party of one. The worst thing to ever be, my mother told me, was to be shy. She didn't care if I was gay or straight or if I was in love with the moon. Just don't be shy like I was. She'd wag her finger in my face and shake her head. Well, sorry to disappoint you, Mom. Turns out, I am painfully shy, and not all that easy to love behind a performative people-pleaser facade. When I let my mask slip, I am too much for most. I am brash, I use foul curse words in public settings where it is obvious but oblivious to me that children are present. I space out on conversations that don't interest me and I talk over others when overly excited about something that does. I complain about every little thing. Like the fact that I can feel my shirt on my body and the sensation of any fabric touching my skin is too loud. Despite all of this, my friends kept showing up for me. Oddities and all. They weren't about to let a silly little thing like debilitating anxiety run clitterference when it comes to their friends having fun. <laughs> so at the wedding, they U-hauled me straight out of the dance floor. The red wine was limitless and the lightweight in me got a little sloshed. Everyone gathered in the center to get low to the top hip hop hits from the early aughts, singing our hearts out till the sweat dropped down my balls till all these bitches crawl. By the time Meche and I finally made our way over to each other, any charm I may have put on earlier was left in a sweaty pile on the dance floor. Her initial intensity signaled that she was indeed into me, giving me so much eye contact it made me retreat to my friends. She got lost to the ritual of various wedding party duties and I kept myself busy by stuffing my face with grilled cheese sandwich sticks while wandering around the botanical garden 
trying to come up with reasons to talk with her again. By 10.30, the night was over, and I was walking back with Fellow and her wife to our hotel. Our newly wedded friends invited us on the party bus to keep the celebrations going with an after party at the rented mansion, but I automatically declined. Oh, well, I guess that's it, I thought to myself, but I must have said something out loud because Fellow was asking me if I wanted to go to the after party instead. Struggling to express my desires, feeling compelled to choose loyalty to my friends over any potential burning of the loins, I couldn't I hemmed and I hawed. I was just a visitor in this land of the lesbians. I couldn't break the glass case holding me back for fear of breaking code and potentially making a mess of my friendships. Fellow took me by the hand, led me up the stairs of the party bus, walked me down to the section where Meche was sitting and ordered me to sit. <laughs> like a mama bird tenderly booting her little fledgling out of the nest, it was time to fly but there was nowhere to sit. So I had to ask Meche if I could sit on her lap. <laughs> Flushed with by panic, I apologized for crushing her with the weight of my gargantuan thighs. She laughed, said I practically weighed nothing, and told me to hold on tight. After a quick tour of the house on its own hill, Meche and I settled outside on lawn chairs. We watched our mutuals as they splashed around in the pool, drinking fun, fruity cocktails in the hot tub. I failed to pack a swimsuit in my tiny party purse, and I wasn't wearing any underwear, no bra, no panties, because again, clothing makes too much noise. <laughs> and there was no way I was going skinny dipping. Sarah's whole family, including her 90-year-old grandma, was there. <laughs> so we stayed on land and just talked for hours upon hours about everything from activism and alcoholism to zodiac signs and zucchini bread before turning an intimate conversation into intimately sharing bodies. Meche could tell I was fighting off sleep, so she asked me if I would like to go to bed with her, and I giggled like a goofy little kid getting caught red-handed on purpose. Unfortunately, her bed was being held hostage in the same room as several other bridesmaids in their beds. After searching the whole house again, we eventually submitted to sleeping on a pull-out couch around the corner of the bridesmaid's room though we were hardly sleeping. <laughs> we tried to be quiet, but all that heavy breathing paired with unmistakable slurping sounds <laughs> penetrated the air. I'd spoon her, she'd spoon me, we'd cuddle face to face, then we'd be kissing, and the sex would start all over again. She kept apologizing for her thighs being too fat and breasts too small. I kept reassuring her that her body looked and felt amazing. We were practically the same size and shape, and feeling like I was getting to have sex with my Tanner twin, was I was properly soaked. In the same L-shaped room of the oddly open floor plan, one of the other bridesmaids who had gone to bed earlier was quietly getting off to the free audio version of our <laughs> sapphic soiree. <laughs> She was in a long-distance monogamous relationship and hadn't had sex in months. Instead of getting all pissed off and sour over two people keeping her up with the noise from a drunken hookup, she decided to make some lemonade. <laughs> after pulling an all-nighter, the sun was up and it was time for me to go. Usually the morning after is so awkward, I'm rushing out the door, embarrassed, I let myself get immersed in another stranger. But this was wonderfully different. My buddy Nicole gave me a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge with our morning greeting like she was proud of me. Sarah's Marnicky was up making breakfast for everyone in dire need of morning after hangover remedies. Spoiled by their hospitality, Meche and I held hands and sipped coffee by the pool while we waited for a driver to pick up my rideshare request. After I got home and crawled into bed, I slept the rest of the day on into the next. Though she was staying in town for a few more days, I never made it back out to see Meche again. We both knew a long distance romance wasn't in the cards for us, but I get updates from time to time over hors d'oeuvres and wine dates with my ladies. This was more than just a one night stand in gay Disneyland. My friends arranged an exchange of affection between me and one of their own, despite my seemingly sinister sexuality, 
and general off-putting disposition riddled with numerous socially unacceptable flaws and cringeworthy quirks. I was invited to come behind the velvet rope, and by doing so, I felt more secure in my place among the pack. Meche and I didn't need to shack up for me to prove my commitment to my community, but it sure is a good time we can all recall the night it took five lesbians to screw in one by light bulb. <laughs> Tiffany Cooper, everyone.